G'day guys, welcome to this video series where we're going to break down everything that you need to know to master each and every detachment in the Chaos Space Marine Codex. We're going to break down the detachment rules in detail, go through what they do and give each one a rating of 0 to 10. We're going to break down every enhancement available to each detachment. We're going to talk about which ones are worth the points, which ones you're going to want to leave behind and we're going to give each of them a rating of 0 to 3. We're then going to break down all of the stratagems, some of the amazing power, which ones are worth the command points and which ones are not. And we're going to give each one of those stratagems a rating of 0 to 3 as well. We're then going to talk about which data sheets pair best with the stratagems, enhancements and detachment abilities to create some truly brutal combos on the tabletop. And we're going to give them a further rating of 0 to 10. Once that's done, we're going to have an overall power rating for the detachment of 0 to 50 based on the above points. This is going to give you a real indication of how powerful this detachment is. Then we're going to include an example list that includes all of the powerful combos that we've talked about earlier. We're going to give some practical examples of how to deploy that list and how to engage with the terrain and your opponent in various mission formats. And finally, we're going to place that detachment on the detachment leaderboard. We're going to give it a tier rating and we're going to place it in contrast to the other detachments to help you decide which detachment you want to field when you're running your Chaos Space Marines. So with that being said, let's get stuck into the video. Look for the Blood God. Alrighty guys, let's take a look at this lucky last detachment. Today we're talking about the Renegade Raiders. So let's talk about the detachment rule first. It's called Raiders and Reavers. And basically this is going to let you have ranged weapons equipped by Heretic Studies models from your army gain the Assault ability. And each time a Heretic Studies model from your army makes an attack that targets a unit that is within range of an objective marker, you improve the armor penetration characteristic by one. So this, in my opinion, is the strongest detachment rule of all. Giving assault to all of your ranged weapons is really, really good because it's going to allow your vehicles with those guns to move further than otherwise they would be able to and shoot. So you're essentially gaining extra movement there. And there's also extra movement on your combat because you're being advancing, you're still shooting, but then you're going in and doing charges, etc. after that using the various stratagems, which we'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> but the real big deal for this detachment is that additional AP when targeting units that are on objectives. Warhammer 40k is all about getting on the objectives, whether that be to control the primary mission or whether that be to secure your secondaries. Either way, it's very hard to play a game of Warhammer where you're not putting valuable units on objective markers. So getting an increase of AP against those targets is fantastic, and it's going to take your little chainsaws from AP1 and put them up to AP2, which means they're just carving through your power armored opponents, carving through vehicles it really dials the damage on every model in this detachment up and it's brilliant because it works in shooting and combat provided your opponent's on an objective so you can pull out your predator and blast him with ap2 heavy bolters you can go in with ap2 chainswords you can dial cursed weapons up to even higher ap vindicators all kinds of stuff you can dial that ap up to the point where your opponent's getting either really bad armor saves or no armor save at all and just absolutely roll your opponent so massive damage increase army-wide and it pairs really well with a few of the stratagems that we're going to talk about in a moment as well so overall i give the detachment rule for this one a 9 out of 10 i think it's absolutely fantastic but before we get into the stratagems that are going to bounce off of this let's just have a quick look at the enhancements available to this detachment because there's some really pretty crazy ones in here first one is despot's claim it's a Heretic Studies model only. Uh, at the start of your command phase, if the bear is on the battlefield, roll a d6. Add one to the result if the bear is wholly within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone. And on a 5+, plus, you gain a command point. So I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Any ability to gain command points is really, really valuable. Because some of the stratagems you're going to have access to in this are absolutely crazy. So if you can get this on a character, I think it's really, really valuable and it's worth considering. But there's some pretty crazy enhancements in here. So it's in competition because not only can you only take three enhancements, but you may only have one or two characters available to put enhancements on. So there's going to be some pretty heavy competition. That being said, I'm going to give this one a two out of three for power. I think being able to generate those command points even if through the course of the game you only generate one or two, that's still absolutely fantastic. And the fact that if you're within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone, which on a lot of maps is a pretty big area, 
you're going to be getting this on a four up is really, really powerful. So I'm a big fan of this. Um, yeah, so two out of three on that. Next is Dread Reaver. So this is only 15 points. Heretic Sturdy Model only. Uh, each time this bearer makes a melee attack, if the bearer is wholly within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone, you can reroll the hit roll and reroll the wound roll. So this is really crazy as well. Being able to get full rerolls to hit and wound without any other necessary elements to be ticked off. Just have to be within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone, which if you're going to be going in and doing combat damage with a character, chances are you're going to be within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone. Uh, for most deployment maps, that's essentially half the table. You know, because most people are deploying 12 inches back from the center. So if you're within 12 inches, it's basically just on your opponent's half of the table. And being able to put reroll hits and wounds on something like a Chaos Lord who's be able to do devastating wounds with his Thunder Hammer is really, really cool. Or something, you know, there's a few other options which we'll talk about later. But yeah, the Dread Reaver, really, really powerful relic. I'm giving this one a 2 out of 3 as well. Next, we have Mark of the Hound, 25 points. Heretic Steel's model only. Uh, models in the bearer's unit have scout's six inch ability. So this one I think is probably one of the best enhancements in the entire book and it's definitely the best one in this detachment. Being able to put scout on a unit is fantastic and what you can do, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later, but you can basically take like a lord, put this on it, attach him to a unit of chosen, put them in a rhino and now the rhino gains scout as well and then you can disembark out from there and you can do some really crazy stuff. So Getting Scout on a unit that can then go into dedicated transport is crazy strong. For 25 points, it's one of the more expensive enhancements, but it's definitely worth every one of those points. So 3 out of 3 for Mark of the Hound. And then we have Tyrant's Lash. One Heretic Stars model. Uh, you can reroll advance rolls made for the Bearer's unit, and the Bearer's unit is eligible to shoot in a turn in which it fell back. So this one's probably one of the less impressive ones out of this list, but it's still pretty good. You know, being able to reroll your advances on an army that has ways to get advance and charge is really, really good. And because it's going to save you those command points, if you roll a one for your advance roll, you're just like, cool, I'll just reroll that for free. You might gain an extra two or three inches out of that, which is really, really good. Uh, and also being able to shoot in a turn in which you fall back is really, really good because you can basically you can use that with some of the enhancement, um, some of the stratagems and some of the play styles that we're going to see for this detachment, being able to fall back, shoot, then charge things, etc. So um, it's really good as well. It's probably the worst of the four, though. So I think you're probably going to see a lot of people taking these top three uh, if they take all three. But you're definitely going to see Mark of the Hound in almost every list, I think. Yeah. Um, so that's the enhancements, and I'll talk about some of the ways that these enhancements combo with some of the stratagems and some of the unit abilities in a moment when we talk about the different combos. Uh, for now, let's have a quick look at the stratagems. So we've got Unfailing Obdurate, so 1 CP. Uh, this is essentially just your Armor of Contempt. Basically, when you're targeted by a shooting or a fighting, um, you can basically reduce the AP of the incoming attacks by 1 for 1 CP. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm going to give this one a 3 out of 3. We've seen what Armor of Contempt can do when your opponent's using it against you. It's really, really powerful. So being able to use it back is really, really good. And um, it's just going to really increase the durability of your units. So many 3-up armor saves. If you're putting Armor of Contempt on them, you know, people with AP2, they're still giving you a 4-up save. It's kind of like having an invulnerable save. So, yeah, really, really big fan of Unfailing Obdurate. I just wish they would just name them all Armor of Contempt instead of giving each one a unique name when it has the same ability, but, you know, it is what it is. Next, we have Scour and Seize. So it's used in the fight phase. One Heretic Histardi's unit from your army that has not been selected to fight yet this phase. Until the end of the phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack that is within range of an objective marker, that unit has precision ability. So this is really good. We've all seen what you can do when you charge a character in. You use precision to snipe out their character. This is going to let you do that with other units that don't have characters attached. And further to that, even if you do have a character attached, now instead of using the heroic challenge to precision out their characters, you can use this. And not only does your character get to hit their character, your entire unit gets to hit their character. So sometimes your opponent will have a really tanky character, like it might be Drago or something like that. And you're like, cool, if I charge in and I precision out Drago with heroic challenge, what if my Lord doesn't kill Drago, gets Drago down to one wound left, and then the rest of my unit now has to hit all the Paladins, and Drago survives, 
and you've actually reduced the amount of damage because instead of doing those you know handful of wounds to drago you probably would have rather kill two paladins because drago is going to live anyway right so this really shores that up it just means that the entire unit pushes through the character before spilling onto the unit the models in the unit uh, it also means that you can do precision, you can do heroic challenge in one place whilst you do scour and seize somewhere else. So you can precision out multiple times. We'll talk about that in a moment as well and ways that you can get the most out of that. But yeah, the scour and seize is really, really good. I'm going to give this one a two out of three. Then we've got opportunistic raiders. So at the end of the fight phase, one heretic you start his unit from your army that was eligible to fight this phase. Uh, in, if your unit's not within engagement range of one or more enemy units, it can make a normal move of 6 inches or 12 if it's mounted. Otherwise, your unit can make a fallback move. It cannot embark within a transport at the end of this move if it disembarked from transport this turn. This is probably one of the best stratagems in the book, potentially one of the better ones in the game. Being able to move in the fight phase is crazy. Imagine your opponent's trying to stop you from getting on an objective, right? So they put big screen out in front of it. You charge, you hit, you kill the screen, and you're, you know, six inches away from the objective. Well, now you can just go, cool, one CP, and I move on to that objective, right? That's really, really powerful. Or imagine your opponent charges you. They fail to kill you, and you're like, okay, cool, I just took a bunch of damage, but they didn't kill me. I hit them back. Then at the end of their fight phase, I'm going to spend one CP, and I'm going to fall back. And now it goes over into my turn and I'm able to charge back in, I'm able to shoot things, I'm able to do all this stuff. All of that for one CP, the flexibility on this stratagem is absolutely brutal. There's other things that you can do, like if you just if your opponent if it's in your opponent's turn, they charge you. You didn't disembark from a transport this turn, so you're able to actually fall back out of the combat into a transport. There's tons of really cool stuff you can do with this. So huge fan of opportunistic raiders. That's gonna get a three out of three from me. Next, we've got Warp Charged Engines. So this one is in your movement phase, Heretic Studies model or Heretic Studies mounted unit from your army that has not been selected to move this phase. Until the end of the phase, if your unit advances, do not make an advance roll for it. Instead, add six inches to the move characteristic. So it's worth noting that this is only for your transports and your mounted units, but being able to auto advance six is absolutely fantastic. As a world leaders player, I use it to great effect. I can use it on anything. They, this is somewhat limited, but the combo that we're going to talk about later in the video that takes advantage of this is really, really brutal. Being able to get bikers that can move 12 inches plus 6 inches for this and then charge is really, really cool. And there's also tons of times where just you need to advance that extra 6 inches to get into a table quarter or into behind enemy lines or onto an objective or something like that. And you don't want to risk rolling for it because you know it's, you know, it's a guaranteed 5 points. All I need to do is get onto that objective. Being able to just go, cool, I'll just spend a CP to make sure that that happens is absolutely fantastic. So this one's getting a 3 out of 3 from me. Next, Ruinous Raid. So there's 1 CP. Uh, in your shooting or fight phase, one heretic studies unit from your army that's disembarked from transport this turn and has not been selected to shoot or fight until the end of the phase. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, if the target of that attack is within a range of an objective marker, you can reroll the hit roll and reroll the wound roll. This one is also absolutely fantastic. One CP and you get reroll hits and wounds, provided you disembark from a transport and the target is on an objective. So there's a few criteria that need to be met, but you're going to be able to just absolutely dial the damage output of your units up to crazy levels. Imagine a unit of Chosen with a Lord in it that disembarks out of a transport, and now they're getting reroll hits and wounds on that target of the objective. So they're going to hit the same way that they used to hit back when Chaos Space Marines were at their peak. You know, one of the things that came through with the other detachment, the Packbound Zealots detachment, was they basically changed it. So instead of getting reroll hits and wounds with their strat, it was just reroll wounds or it was just reroll hits. I can't remember which one of the two it was, but either way, they took half of that strat away. Well, this stratagem essentially brings both of them back in. So yeah, the Ruinous Raid is going to be absolutely brutal. It's going to do way more damage than other detachments because you're comboing this with the plus one AP because the target's on the objective. So now you're going in and you're doing, you know, rerolling hits, rerolling wounds, additional AP, really, really brutal. So Ruinous Raid is on giving three out of three. And then the lucky last one, is Reaver's Haste, one Heretic Studies Infantry or Heretic Studies Mounted Unit from your army until the end of the phase, your unit is eligible to declare a charge in a turn in which it advanced. If you select one or more units within a range of an objective marker as the target of the charge, add one to the charge roll. So advance and charge pairs well with that auto six advance we talked about before. 
it also just pairs really well with like legionaries disembarking out from a transport going in for that advance and charge going in with that reroll hits and wounds you're able to just do so much with this detachment every one of these stratagems is absolutely fantastic this one is also going to get a three out of three it does mean that you're going to have some situations where because all of these stratagems are so good you're going to want a lot of command points to fuel this which means you're going to want a lot of chaos lords so that you can gain access to these stratagems for free or for cheaper um but it's worth noting that you know if you do save your cp and you play conservatively maybe the first one one or two turns you don't do anything super major so that you have a handful of cp and then you have that one go turn where you're like cool i'm going to advance and charge i'm going to auto 60 advance i'm going to reroll my hits and wounds and then i'm going to fall back after fighting and i'm going to do all of that this turn and you can just have that explosive turn where your opponent just gets rolled so that's the way that this detachment's going to have played it's very much about managing these command points because every one of these stratagems is fantastic so let's talk a little bit now about some of the combos so we've we've talked about the enhancements the stratagems the detachment rule some of the combos that really dial this up one of them is like i call it the brutal payload which is basically you take a lord you take a master of executions you put the mark of hound on one of those doesn't really matter which one um and then you join those to 10 chosen in a rhino and basically you can scout that rhino now you can move it up so you can deploy it on the line and the beautiful thing here and we'll go through this when we talk about some different deployment techniques but you can deploy this pretty much on the line because you can scout move it if your opponent goes first you can scout move it out of line of sight or scout move it out of their charge range but if you go first you can scout move it forward so having that flexibility is fantastic but assuming you deployed it on the line you're 24 inches from your opponent you can go cool i'm going to scout it forward six then i'm going to disembark three so i've now moved nine then I'm going to move six inches, so I move 15. Then I'm going to advance, and you could potentially roll a six for that advance, right? So you're going cool, or you could use the stratagem. So you're going cool, I'm, I'm moving six from there. So now you're moving, what's that, 21 inches. And then you're going to try and charge. Um, essentially, you're going to get a 33 inch threat range with this unit on the first turn, which means that you're going to be able to go, you know, almost 10 inches deep into their deployment zone because you're generally starting 24 inches away from each other you know there's some deployment zones where you're going to be even closer so it's going to be even more brutal but basically that means that if you deploy this thing on the line your opponent is going to be terrified they're either going to have to deploy everything in their army really deep in their deployment zone or they're going to have to deploy out layers of sacrificial screens in order to protect, prevent you from just using this unit to just go whoosh and smash into their, you know, really important targets. And a unit of 10 chosen with those two characters in it is going to mess things up. So that's a really, really powerful combo. Um, another one of them is uh, the Great Precision that I was talking about earlier, where you basically you've got this Master of Executions in your army. He can precision somewhere. Then you can also have you know, um, another character like a Chaos Lord precision somewhere else. And then you can also use the stratagem that this detachment has to allow an additional unit to precision. So let's say you go up against Necrons. You can just go, cool, charging into three Wraith Bricks. And then I'm just going precision, 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 and I'm killing all your characters. And now those Wraith Bricks are nowhere near as scary. They're nowhere near as hard to deal with. And it's really going to just make it a nightmare Whereas normally what the Necron players rely on is the fact that most people can only precision in one place at a time. So, sure, you're going to go kill the, the character out of that unit, but then they're going to kill your character, and now you can't precision the characters out of the other units. So, being able to precision across multiple places is really, really cool. So, I'm a big fan of that. Then, the other one which is kind of interesting is the Disco Lord. I think he's a little bit over-costed in general but i think in this detachment he actually works so basically what you can do with him is you can give him the dread reaver which means he gets to re-roll his hits and wounds as long as he's within 12 inches of your opponent's deployment zone so you play this guy aggressively you throw him into their lines he's got re-roll hits and wounds and then you can use things like the auto six advance on him because he's mounted right so he's really fast you know and that's going to allow you to do some really crazy stuff you could instead of the dread reaver relic you could put the mark of a hound on him and now he's going to scout and then he's going to go in so he's really really fast he goes you know about 35 inches total when you factor in everything um i think the the mark of hounds is better on the on the lord but it's an option right so the, the disco lord i think 
combined with his speed, combined with these stratagems, giving him reroll hits and wounds, and then he's charging a target on an objective, so he's got a ton of attacks, and he's going to get additional AP on all of them. The Disco Lord, I think, is really, really interesting in this detachment. So with all of that considered, I'm going to give this detachment with the discretionary points another 8 out of the 10 available, because there's just so many really crazy things you can do with it. So... That's where we're at with that. Now let's have a look at a list. And then after we've talked about a list, we're going to talk about some different deployment tricks and how to wield the army. So pulling up a list now. So we've got uh, here, we've got a Chaos Lord with the Mark of Hound. Uh, we've got another Chaos Lord, just the Plasma Pistol, no enhancements on him. And then we've got that Lord Discordant with the Dread Reaver. Uh, and then we round that out with the Master of Executions. So these, the Master of Executions and the Chaos Lord with the Mark of the Hand are going to go together in a unit, and then the Chaos Lord is going to go with another unit, and then that Discordant on his own. We've then got a standard Cultist mob there, there for holding your backfield, etc. We've got two units of five Legionaries. Now, the, that second Chaos Lord will probably go with one of these. Legionaries are really good in this detachment because they're getting reroll wounds against targets on objectives, and that confers to the Chaos Lord. So you can basically take these guys in a, in a, in a Rhino, throw them out, and they're going to do pretty heavy damage to things on objectives. Um, and they're also just really efficient, cheap trading pieces. So that's those two. Then we've got two Rhinos. Um, one of those is probably going to take, you know, both of these Legionaries. Um, and then the other one will take some units we'll talk about in a moment. We've then got three units of three Chaos Bikers. Now, I think Chaos Bikers are a really good trading piece in this detachment because they actually hit pretty hard when they charge. They're going to be a strength five, AP two, one damage. So they hit essentially the same way that Chosen do in other detachments. But these guys are tougher. They've got you know, three wounds. They're faster. They've got combi bolters. They've got melter guns and those melee weapons. They just bring so much value for this relatively cheap, fast unit. They're really good at bullying your opponent off of those no man's land objectives. And um, they're just really effective. And they're throwaway pieces because they're so cheap. You don't care if they die. And they actually take a relatively strong response to kill because they're toughness five with three wounds and a three up armor save. So there's three units of bikers there. We've got your obligatory Chaos Vindicator. This thing I think is, is absolutely fantastic. It's high damage, it's really tough, it's a shooting threat, and it's gonna force a response from your opponent. And because it's tough, it actually makes pretty good use of the tank shock stratagem now that that's been changed to impact toughness instead of strength value. Uh, then we've got a nice big unit of 10 chosen here. So this is the one that the Lord and the uh, Master of Executions is going to join, and they're going to jump in that second Rhino. So you've now got a Rhino with 10 Legionaries and a Rhino with 10 chosen. We've got a single unit of 10 Warp Talons. Now that the Warp Talons have been changed, they're a bit more expensive than they were prior, and also their ability has changed so that now you have to have killed the target in order to be able to go back into strategic reserves. I think that means nowadays you probably only want one, but I still think they're powerful enough that having one is really, really good. You can deploy this somewhere out of line of sight, charge somebody that's on an objective, they die, you disappear, now nobody holds that objective, which means you can continue to just fight over the other two in no man's land and just keep using these warp talents to keep just pushing your opponent off of an objective. You don't necessarily need to control it as well. You just go in, kill them off of it, disappear. Nobody holds that objective. And it means that they're never going to be able to reliably hold an objective with something that can be killed by warp talents. You know? And there's a lot of things that 10 warp talents can kill. So if they want to hold an objective, they have to put more than just a warp talents meal on it, which means that they're going to have to spread themselves quite thin because they're going to have to go you know, two units on this one, two units on that one, two units on that one. That's probably more or less their whole army, you know. So the Warp Talon's really cool. And then we round the list out with two units of Rubric Marines. Now, these guys are versatile. They can either go in Strat Reserves and just come on and flame or something, or they can utilize those transports as well. So you could put them, they could follow the Legionaries or follow the Chosen, and then when the Legionaries or Chosen disembark, these guys can embark, and then they can run around. So there's a few different ways that you can run them. But the idea with these guys is they're just really, really good. They've got high AP on those flamers that come in and they just do the work. They, they're they really good at clearing objectives because, you know, they've got all of the advantages of this strat of this detachment. And yeah, that rounds out the list. So this is, this is something that I would be running if I was running Chaos Space Marines at an event tomorrow, this exact list. I think that 
previously I've been writing in this detachment series I've been writing ones that go with the theme of the detachment as well as be powerful uh, this one is just pure power but I think it's on theme for the detachment as well because you've got like lots of bikers lots of transports with guys jumping out of it that's very you know um, Red Corsairs style or very you know Renegade Raiders style um, the Discord Lord Discordant is probably my flavor pick. This is something that you could definitely consider taking out if you wanted to take something different. You could replace him with either like a Forge Fiend or an another Vindicator if you wanted more shooting in your army, or you could replace him with more combat units if you wanted. I personally think he's fantastic, but um, you know, that's my flavor pick. So that's probably the main area that you would consider switching things up if you wanted to change this. Uh, I also really like Cypher now with the new... Um, Balanced Data Slate. His ability to make it so your opponent's stratagems cost an extra CP is really, really good because you can use that quite aggressively. Like, let's say you're versing Blood Angels and they've got all these guys around and you're like, cool, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to throw... A Cypher's going to ride around in one of the transports with the cho with the Legionaries. So you've got one with the Chosen, two characters, one with the Legionaries, uh, a Lord and a Cypher. And then you basically can disembark him out and then charge multiple things. And now if your opponent wants to interrupt, it's going to cost them 3 CP. If they want to heroically intervene, it's going to cost them 2 CP. Like, you can really tax your opponent and make it really hard for them to use their defensive stratagems. And when you do that, you're going to be able to roll them up because you're running an MSU-style list. So I really like Cypher. I would have liked to get him in there. Perhaps he's something you could replace the Lord Discordant with. You could take uh, Cypher and another smaller unit to get that you know, capacity to do that or a third lord you know maybe you take cypher and another lord so you've got you know all the units of five everything has a lord in it and then you've also got cypher running around as well so yeah that's essentially where we're at with the list let's have a look now at some deployment uh ideas Alrighty, so for this one, we're going to look at a wtc map and talk about some of the ways that you can use the uh scout moving um rhino in this so assume your opponent's got something deployed like that let's say they've got you know, a shooting tank there big combat brick there some kind of big character there that's kind of shooting and combat whatever you put in whatever you know you, you want there these are just going to be general advice that you can apply to most games and basically what you're going to be able to do here is if you go first you're going to deploy your rhino somewhere like this right where you've got him here and what you're going to do is, if you go first, you're going to be able to scout move it straight forward six inches to there. Then you're going to be able to disembark out your marines, your chosen, somewhere like that. Then you're going to be able to move them forward. Then you're going to be able to advance them forward. And you're going to be able to charge here. And you're going to be able to wipe out that big unit first turn, right? So that's a really powerful alpha strike list. And I'll pull out a ruler in a second and I'll show you the you know, specifics of how that works. And then, but also, so we had this deployed here. If your opponent gets the first turn, you can scout move it six inches down here. And now that shooty tank can't hit you. You know, these guys can't really hit you. And you don't really care if they charge you because you're inside the transport with your chosen. So if they do blow you up in, tran in your turn, in their first turn, sorry, uh, you can disembark out the back something like this. And then next turn, jump out, charge them, kill them, and you probably have your chosen will end up roughly where that transport was, which means that, again, they're still hidden from this shooting tank. They're hidden from whatever this stuff is. So being able to use that scout move on this rhino to basically place it somewhere where you have two potential, you know, final deployments, if you will, right? So you place it here where it's like, cool, if I go first, I'm going to move up there and I'm going to set full send. But if I go second, I'm going to move to there and be safe, right? So let's have a look at some different maps. So on a map like this one, for example, you might deploy it something like... Uh, something like this, right? There. And that way, if you go first, you can go call. I'm just going to go zip to there and disembark out and do my thing. But if I go second, I'm going to go zip to there. And now they can't shoot me because I'm behind this wall, I'm behind this wall over here, so I'm safe, you know? Or it might be you go somewhere like, you know, right here where you're behind the wall. Or actually, you go somewhere like there. Obviously, this depends on scale and, you know, specific terrain placement, but you might go somewhere like there. 
And that way, if your opponent goes first, you can just scout backwards so that you're behind that ruin, so that you're not in it at all. You're not touching the base, so they can't shoot through it. And therefore, this you know they're not going to be able to shoot you. But if you go first, you can move through like that and then disembark out and come down for this corner. You know, same could be said for you could deploy it up here. If you go first, you know, come out there. If you go second, you come back. That's the general principle of this, this transport. So deploying it somewhere where it's as close to the front of the table as it can be, as close to the front of your deployment zone as it can be, but having two options. One where it moves forward from where it is so that it can disembark out the guys and launch them in, and the other where it falls back to be somewhere hidden. And in this list, you're going to have two rhinos. Only one of them is going to have the scout. So you want to give that second location to the other one. So if you've got something like this, you might put one here and one here. You know, this one scouts forward and then this one is ready to, you know, disembark and launch out onto the objectives. Another map layout that we can look at here is the London Grand Tournament map layouts. So something like this, again, is, is pretty straightforward. You go like somewhere like here where you're... Um, you know, you're as you're as close to the um, the front as you can be, like you're touching the line. If you go first, you can scout move forward your six inches to there, and then disembark out and go into your opponent. But if you go second, you can scout move up to here, and now you're behind this wall. You're pretty safe. So there's lots and lots of different ways that you can do it. With this one, your second rhino is going to want to deploy either here, probably positioned like that right there so that he's safe from their shooting threats but you're also maximally able to charge out onto this objective with your legionaries or he's going to want to go down here where those chosen are so that same deal he's going to want to rotate like that so that he's hidden from their threats but able to launch out your guys and in a situation like this you might actually put your um your rubrics they might start behind here somewhere and that way, in your first turn, if you need to, you can go call cool, five legionaries without a lord are going to disembark and advance onto this objective. And then five rubrics are going to jump in the transport. And now, whatever your opponent sends to deal with this, you're going to be able to go call cool, rubrics jump out, flamer it, kill it. Or if they send out something really big, the other five legionaries with the lord jump out and kill it. Or maybe both, right? But being able to have a transport stage like this, it means that you're safe from indirect, you're safe from enemy combat, and you gain additional movement because you get that 3-inch disembark followed by your 6-inch move, followed by your advances if you need to, and advance and charge to get onto that objective. So being able to stage one rhino there and one rhino there is really, really powerful. I really like the Vindicator in Strategic Reserves because then you can bring it on from somewhere over here or bring it on over here somewhere and just blast things. That will depend on the matchup though. There'll be some times where you'll be like, you know what, I just want to deploy the Vindicator so that if my opponent comes out from turn one, I can just start blasting. Um, ultimately, it will depend on your opponent there. Uh, the other big unit that we want to talk about is the Warp Talons. Now, the Warp Talons, depending on your opponent and depending on the deployment map, you either want to start them in strategic reserves and then you just want to rapid ingress them turn two, charge something, and then disappear, and then rapid ingress them again, charge something, kill it, disappear. You either want to keep cycling through like that, or you're going to want to deploy them. And I like the idea of deploying them somewhere like here um, because they'll be safe from your opponent there. Your opponent can't shoot them. And assuming you're reversing somebody that's got a, like a bit of a mix of shooting and combat, they don't have any real easy ways to charge that deep into your deployment on the first turn, so you're pretty safe there. But if they send out anything onto this objective, you can just go boop, kill them with warp talents and then disappear. Then next turn you rapid ingress back here, they can't do anything about it, you charge out, boop, kill them, disappear into strat reserves. So you can do that to basically mean nobody can hold this objective. And if nobody's holding that objective, well, then you probably have Rhinos deployed here, and then the other one, which was here somewhere, he's, if you go second, he just goes back there, so you've got two Rhinos here hiding. Um, but if you go first, that Rhino scouts up and is going to end up somewhere over here after it's done moves and whatnot, and you're launching Chosen out, and then you've got, you know, a, a transport there, you've got another transport here, so you're threatening that objective with your Legionaries and stuff, and your um, Rubik Marines. You've got chosen all up in there and then you've got bikers running around bullying these two as well and then basically the idea will be they can't hold that because your warp talons are threatening it 
They can't hold that because there's 10 Chosen and a bunch of bikes on it and a transport. They can't hold that because there's Legionaries and Rubrics coming out to deal with you. So your opponent's going to really struggle to hold any midfield. They can't take your home because this Rhino that's got the Legionaries in it is equally able to secure your home. So if they do come back, you know, let's say you've got your um your cultists on your home and they, you know, they deep strike behind you or something like that. Because that maybe they got three inch deep strikes or something like that. So they drop in behind you, they kill your chosen and they're they are your cultists, and then their plan is next turn to jump on your home where you can go, cool. I don't care that you've got, you know, three plasma inceptors or something back here. Because I've got two units of rubrics and two units of legionaries all utilizing this transport to get maximum, you know, distance on their on their charges, they're able to to reinforce that as well. Um, and then meanwhile, you're going to have your um, your disco lord, which I'm going to use this. I know he's not quite that big, but your disco lord, he's going to be bullying this middle as well. Because in order for him to get within twelve inches of your opponent's deployment zone, he you know that's nine inches to the center, so he needs to be like there somewhere or anywhere up to long here, or anywhere along here. So that whole area of the board, as long as he's in that area in general, he's going to be getting that reroll hits and wounds, and he's going to be doing pretty heavy damage. And he's so fast that he's going to be able to come from here, and he's just going to be able to go, cool, moving 12, advancing 6, charging 12, and hitting you know, whatever he needs to hit. Uh, that's the, the deployment sort of ideas. Uh, I think this list is actually kind of broken. It's quite powerful, and I think people are going to... We've already seen people putting up really good results with this post... Um, whatever this new new Pariah Nexus thing. Um, we've seen people putting up really strong results with very similar lists to this. Some of them lean more into the MSU without taking things like Lord Discord and, and Vindicator and spending those points on just more trading pieces. Lots and lots of rubrics, lots and lots of legionaries with lords. Um, some people take the warp talent, some people don't. I personally think that their ability to just kill things and then disappear is, is just too good to not take at least one. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of my thoughts on this detachment. Let's have a look at the detachment leaderboard and see where it fits. I'm guessing you guys can guess where it's going to fit in though. Alrighty, we've got our detachment leaderboard here and let's take a look at the total score for this detachment of the Renegade Raiders fits in right here, right at the top, with a total score of 43, so significantly above the other detachments. Now, it's worth noting that a lot of this was done post um, Pariah Nexus, so there has been some changes here. So this detachment leaderboard might switch around a little bit. Um, I'm going to plan to do a follow-up video where I talk about the big changes for Chaos Space Marines from Pariah Nexus. Uh, but I think Renegade Raiders still holds firm on that top spot as the best faction, uh, the best detachment. Closely followed by Veterans of the Long War, which got some significant buffs as well. So I think that the, the ranking of these is probably still quite similar. I think things like the Chaos Cults probably comes up a little bit, and things like the Dread Talons and the Deceptors probably go down a little bit. But ultimately, I think that this detachment leaderboard, this final you know, summary of which detachments are the most powerful and which ones are not, I think is pretty pretty accurate still. Um, and yeah, so let me know what you guys think of the Renegade Raiders detachment and what you think of this overall detachment leaderboard. Let's get a conversation going in the comments below. And if you want to take that conversation to somewhere where we do one-on-one -on -one coaching, we do a lot of training and a lot of sort of list writing advice and stuff like that, check out our Patreon. It'll gain you access to our exclusive Discord server. Um, and there's a really ripper of a community in there. There's tons of really nice blokes. We get along great. We have a laugh. We post memes in there. It's a lot of fun. And we also get a lot of serious work done. You know, you post your list. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about upcoming matchups. We'll give you some general advice. Depending on the tier you choose, we also do regular phone calls and, and meetings and things like that where we'll go through it in great detail, one-on-one -on -one coaching sort of stuff. So if that you're interested in any of that sort of stuff, check out the Patreon and the Discord. And if you want to show your support for the channel in any other ways, go to blogfortheblodgod.com. You can pick up a shirt like this. I've got neoprene objective markers. I've got dice. I've got terrain. I've got gaming mats. There's all kinds of really cool stuff that you can buy, which you get something out of, and it also goes towards supporting this channel. So if that's something you're interested in, check it out. As always, thanks for tuning in. I really do appreciate all of your support. Like, subscribe, all that good shit, and I'll see you in the next one.
Cheers. The Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel.